We've got Ars as well. Uh, La Hora de Jovic. The Hour of Jovic. That's what I'm, Tommy says it's the spotlight, but I mean. I'm sure Graham Hunter will be able to tell us uh, a bit more. La Hora de Jovic. Graham Hunter, good morning to you. Yeah, yeah, what's this? I'm sure Graham Hunter will. I, I, I never like that as an intro line, on eh? <laughs> La Hora. Me into now. The translation of the front cover of Ask this morning, La Hora de Jovic. The Hour of Jovic? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you both followed um, Jovic, I guess, during the Europa League and his exploits last season at Eintracht. And um, I can't remember if I said to you, lads, and you may well know, but last, um, where are we now? Tuesday. So say last Thursday, Real Madrid's players had their Christmas dinner out and it wasn't a raucous affair and... Blah, blah, blah. But there was a secret Santa. And I'll give you the tone in the they gave Gareth Bale golf club. Obviously, they did. They should have brought him a caddy or something along those lines. Or, I don't know, or Lawrence Donegan's seven iron in the soul. But they, they gave you a dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Which, um, it, it isn't only verbally that he's a little bit lost. Um what they're suggesting um, clearly is that having, you know, gone through already, suffered against Bruges, um, boy, oh boy, those 45 minutes of the first half of Bruges at the Bernabeu were, were stunning uh, with your man uh, Tao uh, from Brighton running left, right and centre. Um, now, Jovic needs confidence. Jovic needs game time. They can afford to play him. Um, his, the, the, although he bears no resemblance to Benzema positionally, the guy he'd replace is Benzema, who's playing just about, I think he's played every minute of the Champions League and about 95% of his minutes available in, in the league. He's playing just deliriously good football in terms, not just of goals, but assists and leadership. Um, he is somebody who's loved, loved assuming the mantle of Listen, this is what happens up front, fellas. I'm in charge since Cristiano went. But he's got Valencia away at the weekend and then Barcelona at the camp now next Wednesday. So there's a really logical thing to do that, that he's replaced. And if it's Jovic, then it's overdue that this kid, um, who, who is suffering in football terms because he, he was the, the target man at Eintracht Frankfurt. Um, even when he was playing with Haller, the, the, the ball was aimed at Jovic. He was given service that he swept up and it came from left and right high, where what Madrid right now do is play sort of like constructed football around the penalty area. It's all very give and go, tippy-tappy. And Benzema is the man. And, and Jovic has looked, he's got, what has he got? One goal so far competitively, and he's looked uncomfortable. They say that in training, his spirit is good, that he's a big unit who is beginning to learn nuances to his game, but it's taking him time, and therefore, yeah, let's let's see if we see him in Belgium. Yeah, OK. Um, can we talk a little bit about Pep? Because there was um, stories in The Athletic over the last month or so where details about um, Pep's life have begun to just build a little bit of a picture. Uh, his wife has apparently moved back to Barcelona. She's heavily involved in the management of his career. The um, new performance director role that Manchester City has been advertised and apparently some candidates have been informed that this may be the last season of Pep's time at Manchester City. Part of that seems like it might just be a conversation that you have with somebody for an eventuality, as opposed to uh, this is definitely the end of the Pep era. But... Pep might not stay that much longer at Manchester City. That's a realistic possibility as well. Yeah. Um, look, first of all, um, his wife being in Barcelona, I don't think is in any way um, indicative of, of a definite move by Pep Guardiola that he's going to leave. Um, she is a very independent woman. She is a businesswoman. She comes from a dynasty of a very wealthy uh, fashion manufacturing family. Um, it's a very short distance between Catalonia and Manchester in terms of uh, private jets and so on and so forth. So them all being together is, is not a, a desperate um, problem. I've looked at Pep uh, recently, Jer, and, and seen him looking uh, tired. And I know that after the, what do you call it down there, Carabao Cup, League Cup? Yeah. 
last year when um, they went to penalties, I'm certain, um, they were having beaten Chelsea by six a couple of weeks earlier. I know that the following morning uh, he was um, exhausted and um, for the first time in, in years was like oh, dragging himself to work. And, um, you know, you can see the, the frustration with the situation that he's been left with in that for whatever reason, the, the planning wasn't adequate to take account of Sod's Law, like injuries in the areas you can least afford them will happen. It's just it's just Sod's Law, particularly in football, not just in real life. And therefore, um, I, I accept that it's well within his compass to say, um, yeah, this is it, my year. The, the things I've got in count, and I don't know what he's going to do, and what I would... What I would counsel, I haven't seen how the Athletic have termed it, Jaron, and you were very careful in not saying, this is it, they're saying he's out and all that kind of stuff. He's a quixotic man. That needs to be understood. Although he has very clear and firm uh, ideas and principles about what he wants to achieve, he is quixotic. And if um, if, if Manchester City uh, become uncompetitive and, and domestically, and what's the gap now? Uh, 14, I think. Um, on top place, not on Leicester. Um, that that will cost him. And, and and gearing up to say, I will turn this around again. I will rebuild. I don't think, in my opinion, he's ever aspired to be an Alec Ferguson. Um, never mind a quarter of a century at one place. I do not believe that he aspires to be in one place ten years. I really don't see that. Um, how how will I phrase this best, Chair? Um, I fundamentally believe that Pep has been laying down, not clues for us, but telling the truth. When he talks about the Champions League and he talks about needing the atmosphere at Manchester City amongst the media, the, the, the fans, the executives, the players, as a must win, that they live and breathe, that you, you almost create the pressure that exists, that you both know this, exists at Bayern Munich, at now at Paris Saint-Germain, definitely at Real Madrid, at, um, at Manchester United for as long as Ferguson was there, at Barcelona, at Juventus, win the Champions League, win the Champions League, dominate Europe. He's When he has said, and he has said it time and time again, and occasionally he's been mocked for it, oh, it's the fans' fault we're not winning the Champions League, is the headline afterwards. I mean, idiots, just grow up. That's reporting like that is why we're going to get the half work government that we're going to get in the United Kingdom. Um, he, he wants to work in an environment where everybody, even peripherally associated with the club, is obsessed day by day with the demands of winning in Europe. That's what will make him react best. That's what he wants to see um, as a legacy at City. He wants to win the Champions League at City. And uh, if he sees a club that is unwilling to make that switch, that is unwilling or unable at the moment because they've lived so long in United's shadow and Liverpool's shadow, and that and the, they they're desperate that the, the fans, that everybody associated with the sponsors, that the, the local environment as well is like dominating England, beat United, blah blah blah, and he can't make that change. Then I could understand him coming short of his contract, which which again I'm sorry if I'm not wrong, he's got a year this summer, right? One more year. Thanks. So, Does that yeah. sound right or two? Yeah. yeah. But when he says that he wants to complete his contract. Again, normally, that's the truth. You get an awful lot of truth from Pep Guardiola when he answers questions. It's it's the norm that he will tell you what's either fact or on his mind then. And therefore, I, I don't. I genuinely don't believe that anybody knows that this will actually be Pep's final season. In the conditions I've outlined, it's just outright fatigue or an understanding that he has a different ideology about how City must play and, and, and perform in Europe, then I could understand him curtailing his time at City. But right now, I, I right now I still think that his intention is to complete his contract. But what's his intention for his career overall, Graham? Because it kind of makes sense to get around to different countries, try and win the Champions League in as many different places as possible, but that, that sense of kind of conquest around Europe is probably, I'd imagine, wearing thin a little bit at the moment. In your opinion, what's his uh, overall career ambition after the age of 50? He's 48 now. Opinion aside, I know, um, as a matter of fact, 
that it's it's decidedly one of his dreams to coach Brazil to a World Cup win. Um, and you can understand why. He's extraordinarily attracted to um, to the greats of history. And, and I've said this before, so I'll say it now. When he went to Bayern Munich at first, his expectation was that his next club would be Manchester United. He literally could not believe that Ed Woodward made next to no overtures to get him at any stage. That um, the fact that you know Alex Ferguson had knowingly sent Martin Ferguson over to Barcelona to say, "Will you, will you come and be the next manager of Manchester United rather than Mourinho taking over?" This is way back when he's at Barcelona. Let's get the, the timeline correct. Uh, and and City has been an enormous success, and it's been. I think it's been pretty revolutionary for uh, English football, not just Manchester City. And I genuinely believe that the impact of Pep on English football will be a stone in the pond that leaves ripples for some time after he's gone, whether he goes this summer, one summer and two summers' times, in, in my opinion. But United has a different history, a different tradition. It, it, it attracted Pep differently, and that's where he, he expected and wanted to be. Um, and I apply the same criterion to um, Brazil. It, that criterion is he wants to be part of history. He wants to take his slice of something that is, is romantic and beautiful in the history of international football and that allured him while he was growing up. Whether he achieves that, my point about raising Manchester United is, is that he, he wants to be part of the historic infrastructure of the greats of club and international football. But just like Figo always said that he wanted to play for Manchester United but might not get the chance, Pep wanted to go coach United now, probably won't. I say probably, probably won't. Uh, but Brazil is is definitely one of the things he wants to achieve on for 100% for certain. Whether he gets that dream or not, it's part of the fun of the fair, isn't it? Yeah. I was supposed to move on because we've been talking a bit about uh, Mourinho the last time you were on. Obviously, since then, he's um, fetched up at Spurs and it looks to have settled in quite well. Um, how much of the new Jose Mourinho persona are you buying? I love, I love, have you told him that you think he fetched up? It's a brilliant expression, but I don't think Mourinho thinks he fetches up anywhere. <laughs> he's a master of tactics and strategy, Terry. He doesn't fetch up. I listen so far. I don't take back my prediction to both of you. I'm certain it was you together on the show when I said it's to Spurs' great benefit that he's being filmed all the time, um, or almost all the time. I think we're seeing the cat that got the cream. Um, his clearly his ideas about how to speak to the players every day, who to pick, and simply the the positive backwash of it not being same old potch anymore, uh, has been really invigorating for us outside to watch. Um, Spurs are fun to watch. Each of the players seems to have re rediscovered a, a yard and a half of pace and of intention. But the, the Mourinho thing, I, I, think, he's, I think he's loving um, the facilities. It's, it, he believes still, and I think always has done, that he's the best. When you're the best, you want to go to work every day in a place that reflects what you think of yourself. And, and Spurs Training Ground does that to you. Um, it's absolutely off the scale elite. Um, the stadium, obviously the same. And I think that he feels, uh, yeah, this is right. This is proper. But being on camera as well, I, I said to you, I thought it was good. I think it's wonderful for him. The players, the staff, they're getting the very best Mourinho, somebody who's thinking really hard about what his persona looks and feels like, how it will come across in the film. I really sound like a bad man saying all this, but I'm saying it, one, of, I think, accuracy, and two, I think it's positive. Uh, you said how much am I buying? Uh, so is there a dark, dastardly, sort of pantomime, top-hatted, mustachioed Mourinho waiting to burst out any second now? Well, not, not for so long as it's going like it is just now. The thing that um, interests me the most is that there's a certain core group of players that may not play football the way that Jose Mourinho wanted his Man United team to play or his Chelsea the second time round team to play and that because these players are good footballers, now a couple of transfer windows might ruin this, but that actually they, they're so 
they're so gung ho and sometimes in how they play that it's it's the anti Mourinho type football and that maybe this group of players might free him from his own tactical shackles. Yeah, but uh, listen, as much as you can you can genuinely look at Jose Mourinho now and say he looks eight, nine years younger than he did. Um, he definitely looks trimmer. He looks happier. Um, he's, he's funny again. And if you take that comparison with the Mourinho we saw in his last stages at Chelsea and throughout his United time, then you can also say, well, okay, if you want to jump back, jump back to not as far as as Chelsea, but you know, when Inter were on the front foot, they really played. All right, when they had to defend, fine. But his Inter was extremely exciting. His Real Madrid title-winning side, before he decided that the only way to to trip Pep Guardiola's boss one up was to was to provoke them and to defend and to you know press gang them. Before, in the title season, um, when he let them loose at Real Madrid, they were playing the brand of football you're seeing now at Spurs. I'd argue that you know there's there's not a a huge lack of correlation between the inter treble performance and Spurs' attitude in the pitch, which is what you're talking about. Yes, at Inter, um, Mourinho had the chance to to tinker in the transfer market and put in personalities that he liked. But it's not out with the playbook of Jose Mourinho that, that his teams play like Spurs are playing right now. Like you, do I think that there will be specific additions of savvy, uh, height, power, and probably extra goals coming as soon as he gets hold of the checkbook? Yes, I agree, Ger. I'd only point out that the, 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 the generally the Spurs side that we're seeing right now isn't a million miles from the happiest Mourinho teams. You're covering Inter Barca, is that right? Yep, yep, yep. What do you expect from this? Because um, Inter have been really good in this competition so far. Yeah, big chance for Inter, eh? Uh, no Messi. I think, although Suarez has travelled, it's a, I think it's a toss of a coin um, for me. And Esteban Valverde may well know, may have his team in his mind, but um, you might get... I, I think Suarez probably plays, but you might get Griezmann and Sufati and Carlos Perez up front. Um, there's a strong likelihood that Busquets can sit on the bench. Um, I, I very much doubt De Jong plays. Neto does play in goals for making his full competitive debut for, for Barca. Wild, we changed um, probably Wage at uh, right back. Junior, who's playing, you know, stinking football at the moment, at left back. So, you know, Barcelona will have to go out there and, and compete their socks off, even though it's going to be a, a, a much less recognisable 11. Because qualifications at play here. And, you know, the amounts of money for a win, it's 2.7 million euros for a win. Um, you know, they're, the Dortmund host, whoever's left, or Dortmund are playing uh, Slavia Prague, who I've loved, oh, I, I will hate going out bottom of the group, um, in order to, to joust for uh, the last 16. And therefore, for the honour of the competition, um, you know, I, I expect Barcelona to, to really push at Inter tonight. And um, it'll be an odd-looking team. And, if Conte's got his his pressing game um, as 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 mean and nasty as he tends to, I saw they only drew nil nil at the weekend, but Lukaku should be able to bully whatever standing footballers are at the back for Football Club Barcelona. In all honesty, given Barcelona's recent record on the road in Europe, I would have thought this is a right good chance for Inter to win and go through. Um, I know you're not asking me for a punt, but I'll, I'll, be, I'll be watching and reporting on this with really interested eyes to see what kind of spirit and character, uh, not a skeleton 11, but a wildly different 11 can produce on the road in San Siro. Uh, Graham, like you, you mentioned um, Junior there. I, I was listening to you um, on Premier Sports at the Wanda a couple of, oh, it was about 10 oh, days uh, ago at this point. Condolences. Sorry about that. Then. <laughs> but uh, you're making a, an interesting point. You were like yourself and, and the, the two other people broadcasting with you, um, kind of That's urging funny. Junior on um, throughout throughout the match because there was almost a sense around him that he has a talent but he's almost afraid of making a mistake at every available opportunity like is that an issue that every young player faces coming into Barcelona and not just young players is it perhaps a reason why Antoine Griezmann perhaps stuttered in his early couple of uh, games with Barcelona that there's almost a click you have to get into on the pitch I take your point on I mean listen it is a daunting place and and the way it's been explained to me over and over again 
is that training is a daunting place. Leave the camp now out of it. It's a, it's a no mistakes. Why can't you do this? Why can't you do what we can all do? How many times are you going to do that? Until you settle, until you prove yourself, there is a, you know, although there is a support network and the players will try to reach out and help uh, new players, not, you're right, not just young players, and there will be a level of patience shown overall on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a harsh environment, um, and you're surrounded by not just elite technical footballers, but winners, hard-nosed guys. And yeah, it, it, it's a tough study. But Junior is slightly different from Griezmann. Griezmann knows all about that. Griezmann signed up for that. And it's probably on, I would say, I, like, I sat down and interviewed him for 45 minutes a couple of weeks ago. And I think he understood that he's overthinking it, that he's trying too hard to do things, not only that are Barca, Barca systematic, he's trying to do things that he thinks will please Suarez and Messi on the pitch. To, whereas he's been bought for you know what he's good at and he needs to establish that first and then start serving the other two because if he's scoring then the you know the ball will be given to him whatever so i think in in the last two three games griezmann has adjusted that and you're right he i liked what you described it as a slight stutter um i think he's got five goals across all his games and maybe four assists uh but his work rate is very good until now it's a success he said that when he first moved from La Real to Aleti, it took him until December to even understand what was going on. And then start of the second season, he felt like a new man, like he fitted. Hopefully it doesn't take that long for him at Barca, but Junior's a different case. Junior um, is a guy who didn't have a massive amount of experience at Betis, who Barca picked up late in the market. He wasn't a first choice. He is a good athlete. He's European under 21 champion with Spain. He got a brutal injury last season that kept him out for too long, stunted his development. He hasn't been well taught yet. And at Football Club Barcelona, his positional sense is all wrong. Um, and the game you're talking about uh, against Atleti, um, he clipped that one off the, of his own post, uh, leaving Steg and uh, lost. And he gave away a free kick and just outside, outside the edge of their own penalty box. And from that point onwards, his buttocks clenched. The world was ready to fall out of his backside and he was going, I'm not making a mistake. And by playing like that, you take away all the good side of your game. And if you look at the weekend, 5-2 against Mallorca, the second goal at Mallorca score, Junior is wildly up position. He hasn't read where he should be. He tries to compensate, gets caught out. And at the moment, he's he's a he's a frightened rabbit. And and you don't have long like that at Barca. Oh, and you really don't. But I think the two separate cases. Graham, we'll leave it there for today. Enjoy the weekend. Or the, this week's games. Thanks a million. Cheers, lads. Graham Hunter, give me